poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG needs no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Jonathan Little has amassed $7.4 million in lifetime live MTT caches, including two WPT titles in the Season 6 WPT Player of the Year Award. He's built an audience of more than 127,000 on YouTube, and runs one of the largest poker training platforms on the market, PokerCoaching.com. He's also a collector, which makes a lot of sense considering his background in Magic the Gathering and the sheer coaching talent he's put together, including yours truly, over at PokerCoaching.com. And because of his unquenchable appetite for collecting all the things, he's also recently launched an NFT project with Shocker Actual Real World Utility, called Deck of Degeneracy. The premise is simple enough that it makes sense even to an NFT noob like yours truly. JL and his crew minted 50 decks of 54 playing cards, a whopping 2,700 total NFTs designed by artist Wes Henry, and by owning one of the NFTs, you get access to a membership club. Once you're in, JL and his team have come up with fun challenges like collecting a royal flush so that you can earn additional perks like a 1% free roll, in the 50k Seminole Hard Rock Poker Open that's worth around $500. If you would like to learn more outside of this podcast episode, you may also head to deckofdegeneracy.com. And now, without any further ado, I bring to you the founder of PokerCoaching.com and great friend of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast, the one and only Jonathan Little. Mr. Little, how are you doing, sir? Welcome back to Chasing Poker Greatness. I'm doing amazingly well. Life is full and busy and fun, and I'm happy to be back here with you. You're always nice and chill. You're, you have a nice, chill voice. Yeah, we, that, that's how we do <laughs> things. Um, you, you, you could ask my wife, though, and you may have different, uh, different opinions. <laughs> she, our, our spouses are the ones who always see us at our worst, uh, most frazzled state, unfortunately. I was going to say that it's interesting how um, everyone's spouse inevitably doesn't like them very much, <laughs> Des- despite the fact that, uh, you know, you're good 90, 98% of the time, but that 2%, you go off the deep end. It's tough. It's tough. Yes. And everybody has perfect all the time. You, you cannot, you cannot. Um, especially, especially when you have a job like poker that kind of requires you to show up and play well all the time, because if you don't, you lose a bunch of money. So I think inevitably you end up going home and you kind of slack off a little bit to some extent. I know I, I inevitably do sometimes. Like I come back from a, a, lo- a trip to Las Vegas and I'll just like sleep for a day because I'm tired and I'm worn out. And my wife's like, yeah, you're, you might as well just stay in Vegas another day. But she doesn't realize if I stay in Vegas another day, I'll still just be tired when I come home. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not the solution. The solution is like a day of recovery at home. We, we were just chatting in, in the pre-interview. Um, I went out of town for four days to Los Angeles and came back and I got back about a week ago and still catching up from missing those four days. It, the, the work, all, all the things just kind of pile up um, in our absence. And yeah, so anyway, you mentioned also in, in the pre-conversation, you, you're launching an NFT. And I know you've been, yeah, you've been pretty hardcore in the NFT space as far as it looks like you're just buying every NFT that <laughs> exists on the market. Um, so tell me about wh- where this love for NFTs has come from. I have always enjoyed collectibles. As a kid, I played a bunch of Magic the Gathering, and I made a decent amount of wealth as a child off of effectively $0 and turned it into you know $100,000 or something as a kid playing Magic the Gathering and trading Magic the Gathering cards, right? You find stuff people want, you trade them, you get what you want, and everybody's happy. Mm-hmm. And you do that over and over and over again, and maybe you extract a little bit of value in exchange for giving them exactly what they want, and you take something that maybe you don't necessarily want so much, but you know it's a little bit more valuable, and next thing you know, you do that over and over again, you have a bunch of wealth. And NFTs are similar, except for uh, NFTs can be all sorts of things. NFTs are non-fungible tokens. These are 
call them, uh, the way I view them is to some extent, uh, either a collectible, they're an internet collectible, except for the collectible has some utility, kind of like a Magic the Gathering card has utility in the game, right? Some Magic the Gathering cards are worthless, some are worth thousands of dollars. And what makes one worthless and one worth a thousand dollars? It's, it's, they have utility. So I have been really into NFTs that provide utility to the holders. So I made a collection of 50 decks of 54 cards, they're jokers, and essentially, every time I play a big tournament over the next year, I'm going to draw a card out of a physical deck. So say I draw the um, Eight of Diamonds, okay? If you have the Eight of Diamonds, you get 1% of me in the next tournament I play, which so far has worked out pretty well. I took uh, second place in a $10,000 buy-in tournament recently for 150K. So we sent, uh, you know, 51% to people, 51% because there's a gold card that provides two times the utility. There's some fun gamification in there. Yeah. Um, I've also done stuff like um, buying pieces of other players. I bought a piece of Shannon Shore in the $50,000 buy-in tournament. took fifth place, cash for a hundred something thousand bucks. We sent more money to the people who had a random card. And so essentially, if you hold these cards, I'm giving you back a ton of utility in the form of percentages of my action. Also things like, um, Bonus art. A lot of NFTs are just straight up art by great artists, especially a lot of digital artists who have now found a way to monetize digital art that was very difficult to monetize in the future. They can put out one piece of digital art and say, this is the real one, kind of like the Mona Lisa. If you imagine the Mona Lisa, there is one Mona Lisa, even though there's a bazillion replicas of the Mona Lisa. So why right. is the real one worth something and the replica is not worth anything, right? Because one is legitimate and real. And the artist says, this is the one. And um, the blockchain allows the artist to say that kind of thing. So anyway, I have a bunch of pieces of art I'm going to be giving away from a lot of my favorite artists over the course of the next year. We're having free rolls for people who own a piece, any one piece of, the, of my collection where we're giving away um, this month. I think we have six Ethereum worth of giveaways lined up, which is, you know, 20,000 bucks, give or take, of just, you know, poker free rolls. That'll probably have 100 or 200 people in the tournaments and it ends up being like a $50 buying tournament or $30 buying tournament, something like that, that. People can get on and play if they have the NFT, which acts as a membership card, right? And, and I, 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 like, I like the idea of NFTs being a membership card that gives you a lot of stuff that you otherwise could not get. Yeah, yeah. Um, any plans on incorporating like uh, Poker Coaching Premium into the NFT? Because I know that there are already, I think uh, Ape Styles has his pocket snails where there, you know, that NFT collection gives people folks access to like some uh, behind the scenes training content. Yeah. So we have considered all sorts of things. This, I, I've, I've been in the NFT space for a while. I've, this is way more planned out than you could possibly think it would be. No, no, uh, no. Initially, that, that was initially another were... question of how much time did you spend planning this out? Because I know that there's a lot of thought that has to go into everything. Yeah. A, a lot of, the planning is just, okay, what do we think about this idea? Where could this fail? Where could this succeed amazingly well? Initially, we thought about making the NFTs cost one Ethereum each, which is about $3,000 now. And that would give you all sorts of stuff like lifetime access to poker coaching premium. And then you could trade it or sell it to somebody else. And then they would have the access and you would lose the access. Mm -hmm. But how many people are really going to spend $3,000 on a Jonathan Little NFT just to get access to the training site? So I thought instead, what can I do that is way more accessible? that lets a lot of people get in. So we initially sold these NFTs for 0.1 Ethereum, which is you know 300 bucks, give or take. Mm -hmm. Currently, you have to pay about $600 to get one because they've gone up in value. But for, so you have to ask, what can I actually give for $300? Sure. And I cannot give lifetime access to Poker Coaching Premium for $300 because it costs $100 a month, roughly. So what we're going to do is we are going to draw a card out of the deck a few times over the course of the next year. And if you have that card, we're going to give you Poker Coaching Premium for some amount of time, not, not lifetime access, but you know, maybe a year or something like that. So everyone's not going to get it, but some people will get it. And the neat thing about this is I can draw a card. Let's say I draw the Jack of Spades. I can draw that today. Let's say it's April 4th, just to pretend. Let's say it's April 4th and I draw a card and I say, all right, whoever has this card on April 10th gets the prize. So if you don't want it, you can sell it. If you uh, want it, you can buy it, right? Yeah, that's cool. And then every time that happens, there is a transaction and there's a 10% fee that goes back to the deck of degeneracy boss, me. <laughs> and then all of those fees, I'm going to get back about 80% of them to continue funding this project as long as we continue having secondary sales. So we brought in 
call it 750K, and I'm going to get back like five or 600 of it in the form of equity in various, you know, Jonathan Law action, other people action. Um, for example, Shannon Shore is playing a 50K in Florida in two days, and people have some percent, 0.4% of them, first bullet and second bullet, right? And that costs money to buy. Sometimes he's going to win, sometimes he's going to lose, but that's a lot of fun. That's part of being a degenerate. Yeah, sometimes that's a gamble. Lose, and that's okay. And I'm going to make a point to, you know, buy action in people who I think have a decent edge and, you know, I'm going to go out and play and hopefully I have a decent edge and maybe they'll win, maybe they'll lose. Yeah, but it seems fun. It, essentially, we're trying to figure out a way to make this thing sustain indefinitely. Um, something else we did is if you have a Royal Flush, you know what a Royal Flush is. People here probably know what a Royal Flush is. I, NFT I people don't, apparently. They're like, oh, what's a Royal Flush? <laughs> Three, four, five of hearts. Like, no, that's not a royal flush. <laughs> um, so anyway, I if you have a royal flush, I think on May, May something, early May, I'm going to take a, a snapshot of the blockchain and see who has those, right? And then I'm going to have a party in Vegas on May, uh, June thirtieth. We're going to have like an all day long party. Maybe we go to Top Golf, we go to dinner somewhere, we go play poker somewhere, we go to the club, It'll be like an all day thing. And uh, funny enough, I thought there'd be like twenty people at the party. So far, about fifty people of ours. <laughs> So this is going to be a costly party for me, but I don't care. Such is life. <laughs> you only live once, right? Yeah. And, but like that's so now the face cards are trading for a higher multiple than the non-face cards. But the neat thing is I can change that at any point in time. Something I did yesterday. I said if you collect 22 fours, I will send you 1.111 ETH, which is about four thousand bucks, three thousand bucks, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I thought it would take somebody, I gave people like a week to do it. Somebody did it in about 12 hours. They collect <laughs> 22 of the fours. And there's only uh, 200 fours in existence. They collected 10% of the fours in that amount of time. And I'm sure they were thinking, I'm going to buy these fours, pay a bit of a premium, but out the door, I'll still profit off of, because they're getting $3,000 back, right? right. And, and they probably did. And then they can, now they're saying there were 22 fours. They don't really want 22 fours. So they're going to sell them. That's going to result in more transactions and um, that's going to continue to sustain the project, right? Very clever. So, yeah, anyway, yeah. it's a lot of fun. We also have art by a well-known NFT artist named Wes Henry. He's done a lot of work in making a beautiful deck of cards. And um, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a passion project, right? When you do things that you really love, it does not feel like work. I mean, this, these last few days, I've been lining up a bunch of artists to give back art. And now I have about 35 artists who are just going to give us art, either free or cheap, that I can in turn give away to the holders. And that's going to make a great art collection. Maybe that ends up being what this project is known for. I mean, I don't know. Who knows? I don't know where it's going to go. And I can change the rules whenever I feel like it and iterate whenever I feel like it. And I don't really know where we're going to go. Yeah. I mean, all of this makes a lot of sense, has a lot of utility and is quite fun, right? Like just the collecting of the Royal Flush cards. How... Um, how do you do the drawings, by the way? Is that like RNG? Do you have a physical deck? What is the What do the drawings so, look like? Whenever the people initially bought the cards, they would buy a random card. And once they were sold, it would tell them what they have. So that's how they initially got the card. But the way I'm doing the drawing currently is I have a deck of cards, wherever it is. It's right back here behind me. I have a deck of cards. I make a video with the camera up top, right? Looking down, spread the mm -hmm. deck, show all the cards are there, shuffle the cards, say what we're drawing for, pick a card. And that's it. Um, there's a piece of art that's coming out in about a week by a well-known uh, generative artist who makes art using algorithms. And there's one piece that's like bright and shiny and it says winner. That's all it says. It's like really, really bright and shiny and says winner. And the other piece is just a black background and it says loser. So we're gonna play war for that one. I'm gonna you know, shuffle the deck, take one card off the top, take two, another card off the top. The, the highest card gets the winner. The lowest card gets a loser and everybody else is really a loser and they get nothing. So that'll be fun. We'll see how that goes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun, fun stuff. It's fun. Yeah. I like having fun. And also kind of like pokercoaching.com where I made the training site I wish that existed. I'm making the NFT series that I wish exists because a lot of NFTs do stuff like give away a free shirt. Like, I don't really want a free shirt. I want gambling action and I want cool art that you cannot get anywhere else, right? Like I like exclusive stuff that actually has good value. And I'm fine with losing, but whenever I do need to pay attention, I want to pay attention. Like if you have 1% of somebody in a $50,000 buying tournament, $500 in equity, I, I will probably pay attention. Even being Jonathan Little with you know, a decent amount of money, I'll still pay attention when that player gets deep and makes the final table, right? Sure. So I want to make sure that people actually care about what we are doing when, when they need to care, 
But at the same time, I don't want them to have to sit on Discord all day grinding nonsense games to try to win a T-shirt. So yeah, of course, you know, I made the project I, that I wish somebody else would have made, but nobody right. did, so I did it. <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense, you know, just because you've played games your whole life, I, I presume, and I presume that you're pretty good at gamifying things, and so you've gamified um, your NFT collection, which in my mind and probably to your core audience is quite fun and quite an interesting thing to be a part of. Yeah. So I don't know if I've actually gamified it so much as, a, as opposed to just giving it a lot of utility and letting people trade the utility back and forth, which I suppose is a game. Um, you can go really deep making games. I, if I have one area where I'm really not good at is programming. And so that was my challenge with this project was figuring out how to actually make the cards random, how to actually send the cards to people, how to collect the funds, how to send out the funds, right? Like there was a lot that I had to either hire somebody or learn in the process. But whenever you hire somebody for something you don't really know, inevitably it may end up not being perfectly great, right? But um, everything went well enough. I had a lot of people who like me in the NFT and crypto space because either I've helped them or I bought a bunch of their art or whatever. And it, it all went well enough. But at the same time, I can't be paying a ton of money to design a game that may or may not work. Like I know everything that I already had lined up, even if we did not sell out the project, it would be fine. So like instead of giving out 51% of my action, we'd give out 20% if we sold 40% of the cards. But fortunately, we sold out pretty quickly and uh, everything, everything will work out nicely. Can you give like a, you've been in the NFT space for a while and for 38 year olds like myself, you know, I, I just got my first NFT maybe a week ago for- Oh no, you're doomed. Yeah, for helping, you know, helping uh, a project that uh, is creates avatars that will have utility on poker sites in in the future. Um, I'll send you one of my NFTs. If you want, you want one of my NFTs? Sure, of course. All right, uh, send me your, your <laughs> Ethereum address. I'll send you one. Yeah, I, I just set up my OpenSea. My wife walked me through the process of setting up a, an OpenSea account in MetaMask and getting getting everything kind of going. Um, but well, your for, wife has all the NFTs. Oh yeah, she's. She's way more educated in the space than me. I, I, I'm one of those people that are like, oh, it's like a digital PNG that, <laughs> you know, um, with no utility in a lot of cases, right? Which is kind of uh, questionable to me, right? It's like, oh, it's like all these like digital JPEGs. Um, where's the value and where's the utility? I understand like you know, your NFT that has very specific utility and other ones that have utility. I, I do wonder about, you know, the projects that just kind of randomize a hundred times a hundred times a hundred different like little accessories for the little thing and spit them out and then kind of sell them individually. I don't know. Ex I guess if people pay for them, they have value. That's sort of how we track value in the world. So you have to ask what does this, what separates this project from any other project? Whenever you look at any project, because Kind of like trading cards, most trading cards are worth nothing. Almost all collections of trading cards or all collection of trading card games, almost all of them are worth nothing. Yes, I have, a, so I have probably 10,000 in my grandparents' garage that are collectively worth about nothing. <laughs> yeah, you could probably get about 15 cents for your 10,000 cards because <laughs> right. that will provide someone something to burn to make a fire. There you go. So, <laughs> but, but seriously, that's what's going to happen with the NFT space. And multiple projects come out every day and they sell almost none. And then some of them come out and they sell okay, but then they eventually become worthless because perhaps the, the team does not stick around. A, a big selling point of any NFT is who is involved and have they provided value in the future? I'm sorry, in the past. But if they provided a lot of value in the past or they have a real reputation they will not want to ruin, right. you can kind of count on them to do the work, right? Like people know I have a poker trading site and I'm not going to do anything to screw that up. So it, you, you can you have probably incentive, count on me. Yeah, you have incentive work. to not not rug them, right? Like you yeah. have an incentive to be a man of your word, whereas like a lot of people come out of nowhere with really minimal downside into like scamming a bunch of people, right? Right, and a lot of people in the space are just straight up anonymous for you know either nefarious reasons or security reasons, right? I mean, I get the idea of being anonymous if you have tons of value. Um, one of my main mentors in the NFT space is anonymous. I mean, I've met him in person; it's not anonymous to me. He knew me from poker. He likes me and he's happy to help me with stuff. Right. But he's anonymous because he, you know, has hundred million dollars worth of NFTs and doesn't want to get robbed. <laughs> so I get, I get why some people are anonymous, but at the same time, most people are anonymous because they want 
downside protection, or maybe they want to be able to disappear if they feel inclined. But look, I'm not disappearing. I'm not going anywhere. I've <laughs> committed to making poker coaching content for a long time. And I've um, committed this NFT project for one year, which is important. A lot of people present grand claims about what they're going to do indefinitely. But I knew from the initial funding of this, I could give out you know, five or $600,000 worth of action over the course of a year. And if we don't have any secondary sales, we'll have no money to continue doing this. And people get it, and that's fine. I mean, worst case, we just stop. Um, best case, secondary sales do well. I mean, imagine the cards become worth one ETH or two ETH each, and they're flipping five or 10 times a day. So we're making three or 5,000 bucks a day. We can survive indefinitely. Or maybe we make a new deck and we like reseed, right? We make a new deck with different arts and do season two. So like there's three very clear options for me, depending on what I want to do, because for all I know, maybe I won't even want to do the project in a year. I'll do it for a year, but you know, you, you got to make sure that whenever you sign up for anything, that it is something you can actually do. And people know that I do what I say I'm going to do and I, I will deliver no problem. But yeah. Get so it. your question was about the, the nonsense NFTs, the profile pictures. Um, yeah. So you have to look at which profile pictures have done well and why have they done well. Um, ones that have done well are CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks are one of the first NFTs and they, I think they were the first profile NFT and they were initially given away for free like four or five years ago. And there's a lot of value in being the first or close enough to the first, right? And that's kind of neat. Another one that's done well are uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club, which was one of also one of the first profile pictures, even though it came out about a year ago only. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, they came out after I got in the space and I, I ended up having a few of them at one point, none anymore, I sold them all. But <laughs> they, they've done a really good job of creating a community of people who are like-minded, like to chill, like to study NFT projects, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the profile picture concepts though are based around a community. What do you mean and by profile picture? Uh, like a, like a, like a profile picture for Twitter, right? Like, you know, you put, most people put a picture of their face on Twitter. Correct. Some people like, put a picture of a crypto punk or a bored ape or. Right, right. How, how, how does that of, happen? I've, I've kind of been curious. Um, you can just take a screenshot. Just screenshot it. Yeah, Simple as okay. that. Um, Twitter actually has a way now where if you pay them some amount of money per month, like $5 a month, it can take one of your NFTs and verify that you own it. If you see people with, I think a hexagon, uh, profile instead of a circle. It means that is an NFT that they own, but it's kind of silly to do that because you have to put your NFT in a uh, MetaMask account that is not secure. Not so not as secure as being on a, a hardware wallet, like a ledger or a, a Trezor or something like that, which yeah. is a wallet that makes it really hard for anyone to access your stuff. Like all my NFTs are sitting on hardware wallets. Nobody can access them. You want to make sure you don't get hacked. And the crypto space is very unforgiving. So please, 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 everybody, Make sure you do not get scammed. It's yeah, a big the, disaster. It's a blunder. The, the Bitcoin, no one will ever ask for your 12 words <laughs> phrase ever. If they do, they're trying to scam you. Right. Bitcoin and Ethereum are especially hardcore in the unforgiving nature um, of using them, right? Like you, yeah, you I mean, all, lose your all hardware wallet. You keep, you keep an account on exchange. Like that's not yours technically, and it can disappear. You can get hacked. There's just a, a lot of uh, points of failure. Um, that well, also, also, I'll say that my, when my project started, I had nobody trying to copy what we were doing or like yeah, nefariously. But once we got over 100 Ethereum in trades, we, people started trying to um, like direct message people who are in our Discord with enter this giveaway to win a special golden card and you know twenty thousand dollars. And some people went, I'm sure some people went there, clicked the link and entered their address because they want to get entered into this giveaway to win $20,000 or whatever. And that's just somebody straight scamming, right? Right. And when your project gets big, people will literally copy your exact website. They'll try to hide the, uh, like the, the URL and they'll just straight up clone your account. And it's important to make sure that you do your best to educate all of your holders to not get scammed. And I mean, we, we've done a, dec a decent amount of work to and try to ensure that. Yeah, Although for, so far I know a few people who've already been scammed by just being complete newbies and trusting things that they should not trust. And that's, that's unfortunate, but you yeah. learn real quick and that's why it's important to start small and, um, you know, don't, don't go all in on something you're clueless about. Right. And for the CPG listener, please don't send Bitcoin to somebody saying they'll send you back to, or, uh, click on links in a discord that are from someone that you have no idea who they are, or even a lot of times, if you know, if you think you know who they are, cause you've interacted with them previously, 
still be quite careful about uh, all, all those shenanigans because um, human beings, when incentivized to scam, will scam. <laughs> like that's that's just the nature uh, of you. Got to protect yourself before you wreck yourself. You know exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and where there's a lot of incentive financially, people will just do whatever. You know, there's a lot of these shenanigans that go down, like just in in the poker space, right? It, as it relates to like RTA or multi accounting and MTTs, just where people have incentive to do such a thing, they're most likely going to do it. Yeah, you should not trust most people with your money. Yeah, you'll find out you'll find real quick who you can trust with your money and who you cannot. But even then, you never really know. So you know, it, it, in my mind, if you like never need a loan, don't give a loan. If you don't need to play on illegal poker sites, don't play on the illegal poker sites. You know. So you have, to, you have to realize just because a game or an opportunity exists does not mean you have to take it. And, and that was actually an interesting question with me with these NFTs. Do I need to make these NFTs? And the answer is no, but I thought it'd be fun. And, and I think it's actually kind of where the future is going. We don't need I to do anything, right? Like, don't really need to do anything, but I want to. It'd be fun, right? And, and I like having fun. I like doing things that I'm excited to get up and do in the morning. And uh, this is what does it for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we only have one life to live and engaging and committing to projects that are fun and get you motivated and fulfill, you know, those needs is important. I think everybody should have a vision and do things that move you towards that vision and it's going to change. Like I'm sure probably 3 years ago you had no idea you're going to be launching an NFT project. 2 years happens. ago I thought NFTs were absurd. I remember when Top, <laughs> uh, Top Shot came out, I'm like, why in the world would anybody want a video of people playing basketball? It makes literally no sense to me. To be fair, that still kind of makes no sense to me. But sure. it's, it's like sure. a digital trading card, right? So the question is is should digital trading cards maintain a value? And I guess in theory they should. I mean, I played Magic the Gathering online. I have a $5,000 Magic the Gathering online account with just random JPEG sitting in there to let me play a game. And, you know, I get that that's valuable. I could literally sell it right now if I wanted to get cash in my account in 20 minutes. And that's been around for 20 years, right? So I get the idea of game pieces being valuable. I get the idea of collectibles being valuable. And I don't see much of a difference at the end of the day, besides one is on the internet where all of the kids are living nowadays and one is in the real world. I mean, a nice thing about your stuff in the digital world is it can't get caught in a fire or you can't lose it if you know how to retrieve it, right? Um, also, like with digital art, I, I live in a tiny man, Manhattan apartment and there's no room in my house for art, but I have a giant art gallery online that, uh, you know, is, is a really, really good one. And so there's it's a way to um, express yourself to some extent at the end of the day as well. What other questions do you have about NFTs before we talk about poker? No, I, 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 think, I think that's all my NFT questions for now. You know, I think it's it's an interesting space and crypto is directly connected to poker for various reasons that the major being the utility of crypto as it relates to liquidity. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's something that I will, for better or worse, be investing energy into uh, over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, I would say one, one problem with NFTs is that sometimes they become very illiquid, right? It's not like... Ethereum or Bitcoin that's very liquid, right? If you can sell it for whatever amount you want, to some extent, not always, but whenever you want to sell it for the most part. Whereas any collectible, especially in a downwards market, becomes very difficult to sell. You can always sell stuff for you know, 20% below what anybody else is willing to sell it for, but then you're usually taking a decent loss on it. So, you know, only play with money you can afford to lose. And with stuff like art, buy art that you like. That way, if it fails, then, uh, you know, whatever, you have a piece of art that you like. Or with Supporting content creators like myself, if, if you would not mind giving Jonathan Little $300, then, uh, you know, it, it's not so bad at the end of the day. So you, you want to try to make it to where if it fails, it's not a big deal. And don't think you're going to get in this and immediately turn no money into a lot of money. That's what a lot of people try to do with all sorts of games like poker, like uh, trading, etc. And if Business. that is your goal, I mean, you will usually not do so well. Yeah, Get, get rich quick is, is like not really a thing. Yeah. Um, sometimes you do, but usually sometimes, you don't. rarely, <laughs> it's rare, very rarely a thing. You survived pre flop boot camp. You've shot the fish in a barrel. Now, prepare yourself for the feeding frenzy a comprehensive strategy for gutting every fish in your player pool. 
data-driven hero bluffs, light call-downs, and perfect value bets that are maximally designed to hurt some feelings. Feeding Frenzy. Available now at ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash Feeding Frenzy. Now we can segue into poker. Uh, how has poker been treating you? You know, I see that, you know, I watched your final table at the USPO when you were down to three handed. I believe I was doing a poker coaching play and explain while you were doing that. And I was like watching it off to the side. Um, how has poker been treating you? Poker's been fine enough. I mean, I, I don't really play a ton of poker anymore, which is a bit of a problem. I mostly just play Sundays online and I play big series whenever I can go play big series which really ends up only being about four or five times a year. Um, I try to make a point to play a lot in a short period of time and the poker go tournaments usually allow me to play decent AI buy-ins and decent games in a short period of time. So I like those series a lot, but uh, I haven't really played a ton. So it, it seems like every, every series or so I'll go out there, I'll play six or eight or 10 tournaments, I'll final table something. I mean, to be fair, final table is not, as grand as it may sound, because there's only 100 people in the tournament or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you should final table something <laughs> once out of every 10 times. Mm -hmm. So it's going okay. I mean, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm smashing it. It's not like I'm losing. So it's, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Do you still but, enjoy, in, enjoy the game? I enjoy the game when the environment is good, right? And the Poker Go studio provides a great environment. It's a nice, well lit place. They give you free food. It's, it's, um, they have great tournaments, great dealers, great floor people, et cetera. So, it's a nice, good time. If I'm, if I'm not having a good time, I don't think I enjoy it quite so much. Um, I think the days of going to grind cash games all day in an environment I don't like just because the game is good are behind me. But, you know, if the environment's good, I'm happy to play. Yeah, so it's heavily influenced by, by the environment and it's no longer just like, you know, for love of the game. Well, I mean, it's like, <laughs> there's only so many hours in the day, right? And I have a lot of stuff going on. I mean, m most of my time is spent running pokercoaching.com because that is a business that takes a lot of effort. And that's fine. So I realize I don't actually have a ton of time to go play. Also, I have a wife and two kids and they take a ton of time. So I have a business that takes a lot of time. A family takes a lot of time. And that leaves me with, you know, whatever, yeah, four, four or five or six or eight weeks a year to go play poker, right? So when I do go play poker, I try to play a lot of poker, but it's not like I'm going to grind a tournament all day, then grind cash games all night, then sleep, then wake up and do it all over again. I'm going to play my tournaments, try to be as well rested as I can and still maintain everything else I have going on because, you know, poker coaching doesn't stop whenever I'm uh, traveling. So there's inevitably stuff I have to wake up and do in the morning before I go to play. And I guess, I guess I'm a business person to some extent and uh, not a professional poker player who only plays poker anymore, but I think that's okay. There's a lot of, a lot of value in diversification. Yeah, I, I am not a professional poker player who plays poker anymore either. Um, well, good. You graduated. Congratulations. You I, I have graduated to uh, now chasing around business and, and <laughs> building things out for the long-term future of CPG all the time instead of being on the grind. But uh, well, it's I actually, funny because a lot of people, whenever they get into poker, all they want to do is play poker because they don't actually get to play all that much poker whenever they have a job, right? Most people get to play poker on the weekends and they'll go play poker. 24 hours over the course of one weekend and they love it. And then they go back to work for the next week and then they're ready to play again. But once you lose that job or get rid of your job and you start playing poker all the time, you will realize, okay, I don't really need this anymore. And you don't want to play poker all day, every day. I mean, whenever I was 18 to 21, I played sit and goes like literally 12 hours a day, every day. So three years of that straight. And then whenever I lived in Vegas, I would play five, 10 and 10, 20 at Bellagio, 12 hours a day. No problem. Right. Did that for a few years straight and uh that was enough for me so i'd already accumulated a pretty big bankroll and I, I did not need to do that anymore right and at some point you realize okay i'm doing okay on money and uh, now i'd like to explore other opportunities yeah i think it's a natural part of the progression in the poker journey for most people i mean there are some guys that i believe genuinely love playing poker and will probably just play poker every day and until the end of their days. Sure. Um, I mean, do what you want to do at the end of the day, right? Exactly, right? If that's what resonates with you. Um, yeah. So speaking of, of poker coaching, I wanted to ask you, you know, what projects you're working on that you're excited about at poker coaching and, you know, what, what your vision is for, I guess, maybe the next two to three years. It's hard to project beyond that, I think. 
I don't project very far in advance in general. Um, I just show up and try to do good work. Um, I'm always working to improve the site in general to just make it more user friendly and prettier. I think there's a lot of value in user experience and user interface. Also, um, currently I'm working on going through a bunch of content from the US Poker Open that I just went to play. And, or is it Poker Masters? One of the two, I don't know what they call the thing. The Poker Go Tournament, they have a few of them. And uh, we're gonna be going through a ton of hands that either I played or some of my coaches played out there. And that's gonna do a good job of showing people how to play in tough tournaments where most of the players are really good, but also some of the players are not so good or how to play against players who are pretty good, but will likely make general mistakes that people like good regulars make, right? Like a lot of people, I don't know, unless they don't check raise the river often enough as a bluff. So that allows you to value bet a little bit thinner, perhaps. It also allows you to fold the check raises way more often. And um, that's, a, that's a project I'm working on currently. We also have a few of those players who play the super high roller tournaments lined up to start making content for poker coaching. I'm not gonna announce that till they actually have stuff turned in. I, uh, I, I try, I've learned to not announce stuff unless it's actually done in my hands, but we have a few of the biggest winners in the game lined up to make content for us that will hopefully be out towards the end of the year. And I don't know how much of my time that's going to require because maybe they just show up and do great work or maybe I have to help them a little bit with it. But that's exciting too. So we have, we have a lot lined up in terms of many years in advance. I don't know, man, show up and do the work. And uh, so far we, we show up, we do the work, we continue putting out top of the line content and uh, people seem to enjoy it. Do you know how many coaches you have uh, that make regular content on a monthly basis? I don't know, man. <laughs> 10 or many? 12, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> It's a it, lot. It, it I mean, some, sometimes coaches make content on a month and they'll take a month off. Or I mean, I, I re realize that poker players have a lot of stuff going on. And especially tournament players who have a schedule sometimes jam-packed and sometimes completely empty. Um, I, I try to be very, I mean, I, I let the coaches do whatever they want to some extent. I let them make the type of content they want. I let them turn in content when they want. And I found that that generally keeps coaches happy. I know a lot of the other training sites out there make people sign contracts that are long and they require them to turn in X amount of stuff every month. And a lot of coaches come to me disgruntled. I'm like, oh, come work for me. And then they say they can't because they signed a contract. They say after they quit this one place, they can't make content for a year for any other site, et cetera, et cetera. Like I don't do any of that stuff. I mean, I, I guess I started as a content creator myself and I realized I just kind of want to do whatever I want to do within reason. And um, all my coaches act well within reason and they turn in great content because I think I let them do generally whatever they want to do. I can verify on all of these things from personal experience in, in each one of them. I have signed contracts. I have gone through that whole thing. And obviously I've worked with you now for well over a year on the cash game side for, for poker coaching and we'll confirm that. Yeah. Very chill, very lax. Like let's <laughs> Brad, as long as you do the work. We're nice and lax and you do the work. No problem. And uh, fortunately I usually only work with people who I know or people who have been vouched very highly for me by other people who I know. And I, I've had no real problems. And, you know, sometimes we stop working with people for one reason or another, and that's fine. Right. I mean, sure. Uh, usually, usually they break up with me. I don't break up with too many people for whatever reason, because I, I guess I've been lucky in that I hire pretty good people to begin with, but you know, sometimes people's priority changes or they don't want to make content anymore. Maybe they don't like it. Right. And fine, not a problem, but I found that a great way to keep, employees happy is to kind of let them do whatever they want while also ensuring they're generally motivated people to begin with. And if someone's kind of lazy especially. and is not motivated, then there's not much you can do. But pretty much everybody I hire is a self-starter and are very motivated to do their work and add value. Yeah. The, the poker player makeup is not one that likes to be caged in <laughs> and bound and told what to do. I think it's just kind of, kind of part of the gig that poker players want autonomy and freedom and they especially want to feel that if they're making content for a, a training platform. And, yeah. And I mean, I, you tell me what you want to do and I'll see if we can make it work. Right. Right. And, and it's, I feel like it's almost my job to make the coach's life as easy as I possibly can so that they want to show up and do the work. Cause if it's ever difficult, you're just going to want to stop. I remember I used to make content for a company and the back end to actually upload the content was incredibly difficult, incredibly tedious. And making the video would take, or making the content would take an hour, let's say, but uploading it and putting it on the site would take another hour. Like, I'm just not doing this. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to help you, but uh, your program's broken. So I try to do everything I can to just make it as absolutely easy as possible for anyone who works with me to 
do what I need them to do, right? Like I, I don't need a coach to be uploading stuff on the back end if it's anything more than just drag the file to this place and that's it. Um, I mean, it's my job to have somebody else enter in all the relevant information and tag the thing and all that. So I found that if you let people do what they are expert in, they're usually going to be pretty happy. If you make them do a lot of stuff they are not expert in or don't want to be doing, they're going to quit. Yeah, and it, it filters, you know, the coach's experience filters to the user's experience. It filters into the growth of the business. Um, I can tell you that, like, you get locked in a contract that you don't want to be in and everything is difficult. Yeah, you, you're probably not all gung-ho <laughs> about promoting that platform. Um, you're going to do the bare minimum, turn your work in, and move on, right? Like, yeah. so it just makes good business sense. And also, I think, uh, yeah, just the quality of content goes up. I'll never forget one of my, one of my students watched a video that I had published somewhere and said like, wow, you know, I've watched a lot of your like play and explain videos, Brad. And this was like the most phoned in one that I've ever seen. Like it was obvious that you weren't, you just weren't feeling it, you know? And to me, it wasn't obvious when I made it, but that was how I was feeling. And that was, the result of that. It, I'm not proud of um, submitting work that wasn't uh, 100% to my capability, but it was reflective of how I was feeling at the time. And so like, there, there's just all these, you know, consequences that stem from making the coach's life more difficult and not having like a, a smooth streamlined process where people can just do the thing they're really good at, um, turn it in, and then just kind of move on and have the autonomy to come up with curriculum or ideas or um, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, and well, to be, I don't want to make it sound like I'm uh, hating on the other poker training sites because I'm not. No, no. I realize though that my poker training site is ran by me and a few very, very good poker players who understand poker very well and understand poker players very well, right? Whereas a lot of the other training sites are ran by marketing people who know poker a little bit. And as you know, less and less about the thing you're trying to do, like run a poker training site, right? As opposed to like run a marketing platform. Um, you, you need to have a lot of rules in place because otherwise, how are you going to know if this guy's going to show up and do good work, right? There's like no way you can really know it. But if I've played poker with you for 20 minutes, I can probably tell you if you're going to be somebody who's actually there doing your best work, which you know may sound egotistical on my part, but you learn a lot about people from how they play poker. But if somebody's not a poker player, doesn't even know what to look for, you will not know if someone is a self-starter and somebody's going to be motivated and someone who will show up on time and do their job appropriately. But you can learn a lot by just knowing the space really, really well. And fortunately, I know the space well enough to where I can take good coaches. So I'm very fortunate in that we have a few people like that who work with us. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, and speaking of like the content creation side, what does that look like for YouTube? I see, you know, you've well eclipsed over 100k subscribers on YouTube. Um, I don't think your morning coffee. I guess it's it's brain fuel these days, right? Yeah, we did that this morning. We just so we. Uh, I don't do it whenever I'm traveling because that's not easy for me. I don't want to wake up at 6 a.m. Pacific time when I have to play a tournament at noon to do that show. So I don't do it. Right, kind of like I let the coaches do what they want to do. If I don't want to do it, I don't do it. But whenever I'm at home, I wake up at 6 a.m. with my kids, I deal with my kids, I get them out of the house, and then, then it's 9 a.m. and I have nothing to do. So we'll sit down on Mondays and do that show. Today we talked about how to crush your poker home game, various tactics to do that, such as make sure you know the random games they're going to play, make sure you figure out exactly what your opponents do, make sure you're not going to get crushed by rake, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway. Or um, robbed or taken advantage of and paid out, all, all of we, these. We talk about all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly accurate. Um, but so my YouTube content creation has changed a ton over the last few years. I used to do it all myself. Now I do almost none of it by myself. And the, uh, the product has become way better. Now it's, it's, it's about as easy as it can be. I get sent a document of a video and listing relevant things to talk about, listing key poker points to make sure I talk about it, listing things like important keywords to make sure you say, and then I make the video. And then I upload the video and then I don't touch it. And then a week later it comes out on YouTube like magic, fully edited and everything. So, but like that, that, that's comes from being in business a long time and struggling and learning to do it myself and hiring people who can do it better than I can do it. Cause I'm not an editor, right? I, I don't, I don't know how to do much besides play poker. And so uh, I, I know how to discuss poker concepts. So let me do that. I'll give the editor their job. I'll give, um, you know, 
poker strategist to also like, you know, really make sure I talk about these particular points or these very high level points that you'd only know if you ran the spot through a solver and you know, node locked it for various scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. And nice and easy. I it try to seems, make stuff easy for me. It seems like one of your, you know, superpowers is developing very sound processes for things, learning from pain points and streamlining those processes over time, right? It's like, I think this is a very useful skill for poker players or professional poker players of doing something and then thinking about what happened, um, the process in which they arrived at their decision and then trying to upgrade that process over time and just iterate and iterate and iterate um, and just try to get a little bit better day in and day out. And it seems like you've trans you transferred those skills to the business world as well. Yeah, I mean, whenever you're running a business by yourself or mostly by yourself, um, a long time it was just me and a marketing partner who would deal with emails and making websites. He would do all the website marketing stuff. I would do all the poker related stuff. And I realized I don't really like managing coaches, right? <laughs> That's not something I necessarily want to be doing. Right. Even though most of, my, most of my coaches are great. I don't want to make sure they turned in all their content. I don't want to um, send out payments to everybody. I used to do that all the time. It would take me you know, many, many hours to send out payments to various affiliates and stuff like that. So I don't like editing videos, right? But, but I could do it okay, right? Mm -hmm. And as you have a little bit of success, you inevitably have some funds to spend to have somebody else do those things. So... I essentially just outsourced everything I don't really want to be doing or things I'm not particularly good at to people who like to do those things. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the stuff that you don't want to do does not necessarily mean that that's something that everybody doesn't want to do. Like some people love editing videos. Like that, that's all they want to do all day. So great, let them do it, right? Some people like interacting with the coaches and talking to the coaches. Great, let them do it, right? So Find people who want to do the things that you don't want to be doing, who can do it better than you. And it's, it's tough to fail if you do that. Yeah. I have a, a guy in my Slack community, shout out to Renee, who um, makes the ads for the podcast. And he's an audio engineer by trade and does a lot of the, uh, it sets up a lot of the sound for like the Dallas Mavericks in Texas and just other giant productions, um, exceptionally professional. And he loves making the ads for CPG and like he's incentivized to do so by getting, you know, some free coaching or free content, you know, behind the scenes. And like to him, it's like a, a fair and fun. And to me, it's a, it's an easy trade. Right. Um, so there's always people. And I, and if you would put a gun to my head and said, Brad, you need to make a podcast ad, I, I would do it. Um, but I wouldn't do it willingly. <laughs> it's not something I would enjoy spending my time doing and he's way better at it than me. So yeah, it's like, there's always somebody, somebody in the world that's really good at a thing that you don't want to do um, that you can outsource if you can make sure that the incentives are in alignment, right? Like I, I know there are plenty of marketers and copywriters that enjoy um, writing every single day and enjoy honing their craft on a daily basis. And by the way, like copywriting is a craft and it is something that you need to hone and practice and invest a lot of energy into perfecting over time. Um, and I just don't have the bandwidth to do said activity, but there are people that do it at a very high level. And yeah, I think you still that's write your emails key. every day. I don't. Uh, so I haven't. So last time I was here, you still did it. And I said, you know, maybe you should, maybe you should take it off. Maybe I don't, I don't write, I haven't written an email in a while. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why most, most everything for me has gone on pause while I've been building my coaching for profit operation over the last six to eight months. So I haven't prioritized selling courses. I now have a, a private coach who I refer people to instead of myself. So I don't even offer private coaching publicly anymore because of you know the, the CPG Wolf program. Um, and when I do start writing daily emails, most of them will be about the Wolf program when I have it fully fleshed out and streamlined and in, in, the, in the place where I, I know it needs to be in order to start onboarding many more people. How did it feel when you stopped writing an email every day? It felt good. It felt yeah, good. I'm not going to lie. You, you probably didn't think it would feel good. You probably thought it'd be like, oh no. Yeah. There, there is this like anxiety in the pit of my stomach by not doing it, but I, I could rationalize like the building the CFP was ultimately the most valuable thing that I could do. And, you know, I, I can just take off a year, a year and a half from writing the emails. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we talked about last time about how I, I was like locked into some stuff that I didn't necessarily want to be doing, but I felt like I needed to do it. And you got to be careful locking yourself into stuff that takes a lot of time that you feel like you have to do, even though you don't actually have to do it. Yeah, it's so, like um, I'm good. You're focusing on the things that are probably more high value. Right. Or at least things you enjoy more. Right. I mean, you can still enjoy writing the email, but maybe that's not what you should be doing. Right. T tying it back into poker, right? Like w whenever you're thinking through a decision, your thought process involves prioritizing different data points and you're going to prioritize one over the others. And, and like business is the same, right? Where there's many things in a day, there's an unlimited amount of things I could spend my time doing on a daily basis, but it's up to me to prioritize what I think is most important and then do that thing. Um, and that's just something that, you know, you learn. I I'm learning, Mr. Little, I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that making sure I have these priorities at least pretty clearly laid out is pretty beneficial for me. So I, every day I'll have something that I really need to do, whatever that is. Make, make, a, make a training video, make, make multiple training videos, outline a course, write a book, whatever it is. Like some, I have some big project to do every day. And I wake up and I make a point to spend a decent amount of time doing it. If I don't get it done, I'll do it the next day. And I, I think what happens to a lot of people is they just have a bunch of stuff to do. And they inevitably kind of flounder because they don't, they, they get lost on Twitter or whatever. And the next thing you know, it's four o'clock and like, oh man, I need, I should probably do some work. And they yeah. work for two hours and then they're done and they don't get anything done at the end of the day. I mean, people ask me how I get so much done. I mean, I outsource all the stuff I don't necessarily want to do that I'm not good at, but also I sit in this office for about 10 hours a day, every day. Well, every day, Monday to Friday, five days a week. That's it. Only 50 hours a week. It's all it takes. You can get a lot of stuff done if you actually sit here and do the work. But yeah. Most people get, dis I mean, I make a point to like not get distracted. And if I do get distracted, it's for 30 minutes of lunch. Whenever I have lunch for about 30 minutes, I let myself do whatever I want. And I, I mean, don't feel bad about it. And I'm happy about it. 10 hours a day. That, that's a long time. You know, I think yeah. it, 50 hours a week, that, that is quite a, quite a load. Um, and I think, most Genuine. people work 50 hours a week. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> and I, I spend probably, uh, I was laughing because I, I have my, my Apple watch now that tracks my metrics um, on a daily basis. And me and, uh, uh, me and John, my Tactical Tuesday co-host, were laughing about their days where, you know, we get in like 350 step days that are basically just walking to the computer, using the bathroom a few times, and then laying on the couch and going going to sleep. Right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. That's probably what I'm doing right now. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's not good. It, it's not good. Um, but I, I think that if if the listener would spend just a few hours targeted doing their highest priority thing, they could get way more done than they think they could get done. You know? And to be fair, maybe your highest priority, priority thing needs to be getting the gym. Yeah. <laughs> if you're putting it, it, in there, it should I mean, be. So one of my things that I, I write myself an email at the end of the night, stuff I got to do in the morning. One of them is get in the gym. So I, I get in the gym, right? I and have I remind been. myself to do it. <laughs> now that, that I can way I get I, in more than 350 steps. Now yeah. I get in 380 steps. Or something. Exactly. <laughs> you're making uh, that, that's a 20% improvement, right? Or 10% yeah, improvement. Great. Um, <laughs> while, while I was in California, you know, I have my settings and I have been like closing my rings, closing my circles on, on my Apple watch. So that's nice. We walked seven miles one day. So yeah, I have been prioritizing more of physical health because, you know, your, your brain goes where your body takes you and it's amazing. And also nutrition too, right? Just like eating the right things, putting the right thing in your body, making sure to consume like plenty of greens on a daily basis, I think is like very, very, very valuable and important. So all, all these things sort of feed into you doing the one thing that you're prioritizing, whatever that thing may be. Um, and just, you mentioned distractions, eliminating distractions, I, I think can change people's lives, silencing your phone, putting your phone in another room, putting up mechanisms to stop you from like surfing the web or get notifications. Like I'm, I actually, when, when the app, I'm not going to lie. When the Apple watch came out, I thought it was kind of dumb. I was like, uh, I don't understand. It's kind of dumb. But now that I have it, what I realize is like, I get a message and I look at it on my phone or on my, <laughs> on my watch. I don't look at it on the phone. And then I don't spend 30 minutes surfing Twitter or whatever it, uh, was that I got sucked into after picking up the phone. So just putting these but like- That's interesting because I, I don't even get the notifications. 
because uh, I do not have an Apple Watch. I have no watch anymore. <laughs> and that's by design. And my, my phone's just usually on silence. And my wife will come anywhere every once in a while. Like, why didn't you answer my text? Because like, I didn't look at it. Yeah, I don't look it's at in airplane text. mode, right? Yeah, so it's like, it might as well be in airplane mode. And I don't even look at stuff whenever I'm in the office grind. I mean, I'll look at it whenever I, you know, I'm eating my lunch or if I have to go outside to do something. But um, I, like, I don't even see it. I, I used to get notifications all the time for like every email that came in, hundreds of emails a day. So like, I don't need that. I mean, another good example is like emails. So I'll answer my emails two times a day in the morning and before I'm done for the day. And that's it. Like I'm not replying to emails in the middle of the day or anything like that. And I think that that is valuable because it lets you focus on the stuff that you want to be focusing on. It's really easy to get distracted with stuff. I mean, going back to the NFTs, maybe that's just a big distraction for me because it's, it's eaten up many weeks of my life at this point. And uh, maybe it's a distraction. But I would recommend that people find stuff that they enjoy doing where they are building something and adding value to other people. And if you do that, like even if it doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily end up being monetarily rewarding, you'll know that you have helped people and other people have enjoyed their selves more because of you. So uh, I would recommend people be careful making the priority of uh, play a video game and get to X level today. Like that's probably not a good use of time or you know, maybe even grind poker 12 hours in a day. That's probably not a great use of time. You want to make sure that you are doing stuff to set yourself up long-term and certainly you have to work hard to develop any skill, but you, know, you want to make sure that you're doing things that are actually beneficial at the end of the day. And speaking of minimizing distractions, um, what would you say is a thing that folks who pursue poker uh, at, at a medium to high level get distracted by that they they can feel like they're actually doing work, but they're not actually really doing very much. Social media, you know, do people view that as work? I don't know. I mean, I know <laughs> I, I sit there and play high stakes poker tournaments. I watch some of these people grind on Twitter all day and I don't know what they're doing. Um, maybe they think they're goofing off. Maybe they think they have to do it. Maybe they think they have to keep up with all these people. The tough thing about social media is it's pretty easy to click the follow button and kind of difficult to click the unfollow button. And so inevitably you have a following list of thousands of people and a lot of people feel like they must be a completionist. They have to read everything that comes through. And <laughs> finish now I have Twitter. Like, yeah, I have like three lists that have something like 20 people on each list. And I just go through those three lists. I'm reading what 20 people put out each day or 60 people put out each day on three different topics. And that's it. And it doesn't take much time at all. And sure, you don't see everything, but who cares? It doesn't make a difference. Because to be fair, most stuff that most people do does not make a difference to your life whatsoever. And that's okay. So... Uh, that, that's something people end up spending a lot of time on um, playing other games, right? I mean, a lot of poker players play nonsense games. I say nonsense games, games that you don't really play for money, you play for fun, right? Or for entertainment, I mean, myself included. I inevitably fall into Magic the Gathering every once in a while. And next thing you know, I've spent 20 hours in a week on it. I'm like, oh man, that was, that was an error. Sure, I had fun. Maybe even I made a few bucks, but it's like for enjoyment, it's a hobby. And the question is, is do you have time in your life right now for a hobby that takes 20 or 30 hours a week? Maybe the answer is yes. Maybe the answer is no. It depends on what you have going on. But whenever you have a business and poker and an NFT series and a wife and two kids uh, and this podcast to do here, you don't have a lot of time to be doing other stuff. And that's okay. That, that is something you'd like to be doing, but something you have to push to the side for now. And, and that you just have to be okay with that and not feel bad about that. Like I used to feel bad about not being able to do some things. Like it was always one of my goals to learn to speak other languages. But it wasn't really a goal. I wasn't actually going to try that hard. And I wasn't really going to put that much effort into it. And for like six months, I'd be like, oh, I should really be spending more time on this. And I would just kind of feel bad about myself for not doing this thing. But then I realized, like, I don't have the time and energy to put into this right now. So I'll put it off. Maybe we'll return there later in the future. But I'm not going to feel bad about it. It's gone. It's done. I'm not doing it. It's not yeah. out of my mind completely. It, it's like there's an infinite amount of amazing books to read. And yeah. it's impossible to read them all before our deaths, right? Yeah, so I mean, like under my desk wisely, right, here, right? I have, I have uh, probably 30 books to read. And whenever I go on a trip, I'll take one or whenever I have a little bit of time, I'll sit there and read for an hour or two, but I've, I'm not going to get through all of them. And I fully realize that. And I'm cool with that. Right. Yeah. I've I think to... a lot of people get it in their minds that they must complete everything they start. And that's a real big problem, especially with things that are never ending, like read all the books that I'm recommended or play various video games, especially ones that are open-ended and last forever. There's a Mario Kart game on, on the iPhone that my, my kid liked. 
And so I, I inevitably uh, started playing it for fun to, to level up the character. You can level up the characters indefinitely. And next thing you know, I'm spending 30 minutes a day playing Mario Kart on my phone. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing ever because I don't need to play Mario Kart on my phone. And I got, got rid of it, right? I mean, I'm sure, I had a very high level, high level account and it's just <laughs> done. And I'm okay with it. It's not a problem, right? So I, I'm always looking out for things that I'm doing that are not either like things that I... I, I'm going to be adding values, what I'm else, either to my bank account or to other people. One of the two, you either want to be making a bunch of money or helping a bunch of people. And if you're doing things that either make you a bunch of money or help a bunch of people, then you'll probably end up being okay. But if you're doing stuff that's pretty much only for you, if it doesn't make you any money, then maybe it's something you need to be doing differently. Probably yeah. health is also something you should focus on though. Like getting in the gym is something you kind of do only for you or um, kind of do for other people, like, you know, your family and sniffing others or whatever. But, um, you know, health, health is important as well. It, it is for sure. And uh, <laughs> um, I think Jonathan's wife just handed him, look like a, some sort of my wife handed me the baby monitor. I guess I have to watch uh, the baby. baby. I don't know where monitor. my wife's going. I see. So it's not a switch at all. It's something that's more important than that. Baby monitor. Uh, um, whatever. <laughs> I've gotten... I've got, I've had to get okay with reading 10 or 15 pages of a book and realizing like, okay, I just don't need to finish this book. Like I, for a long time, I wanted to finish every one that I started. And now it's like, all right, like a lot of people highly recommended. It. It's not resonating with me. I got to move on to something else because I think there's a program that Alex Fitzgerald recommended to me a long time ago called Blinkist. I think is what it's called. Basically it's a bunch of book summaries. that's yeah. like five pages long and if you get a book and you want to read the book, but then you just kind of hate the book, but you want to have some idea of what people are doing, maybe you need to maybe look at something like that. Yeah, there's Lucid. Uh, it's an app that I pay for that gives like, uh, you know, the, the biggest ideas, bite size and cliff notes. And you can go through a book in, you know, 20 minutes or something like that with, yeah, full with visual illustrations and uh, nice. built, built in mechanisms to help you retain the information. And I find that that's quite, quite nice for, uh, getting the high level concepts out of, you know, some of the more popular books in, in pop culture or that folks are recommending. Uh, also although look into that, yeah, you want people need to look at where are they spending their time and where they're spending their money? Both of those things. Right. I mean, a lot of people just spend a lot of time watching TV each day and you know, like some's fine, but you got to ask, could I, could I, or should I be using my time better, especially during the COVID period? Uh, you, you very easily could have learned a ton of things or you could have watched a ton of Netflix and it was up to you. And some people learned a ton of skills during that period of time. And some people did not. And yes. some people worked like 80 hours on their business every single week. Wow. Yeah. Probably me and you. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and good. Now we have something to show for it. Whereas we could have done nothing and had, well, we could have watched TV and we could have known all of the lots of all the TV shows. I, I could have gone to the gym more. I think my body fat percentage definitely went up in, in the, the COVID era. I could have gone to the gym more too. They actually, I have, I have a gym in my building, but they closed it during COVID. And I used that as an excuse to not get up and go outside or anything. Right. And that was a problem, but whatever, we're back in, we're back on it, right? Just because <laughs> you stop doing something, because you start to fail at something does not mean that you have to be done with it forever, especially if you want to be doing it or know you need to be doing it, right? Po like studying example. poker, say yeah. you took, took poker off for or stop studying poker for a little while, but you want to play poker. You want to, you're, you don't want to lose. Well, get back into it. Right. I mean, you're not always going to do perfectly all the time and all you can do is show up and do your best. Right. But you have to make a point to change things that you do not like about your current situation. And if you don't like the way your body feels, then change it. And, uh, going back to you playing poker before, before we wrap up here, um, what do you do as someone with, a bunch of different priorities who wears a bunch of different hats and has limited time to keep up, um, with the poker strategy, you know, as it evolves, like, how do you, how do you fit in poker growth into your just daily routine? So I go through a lot of the content that comes in to pokercoaching.com. I watch a decent amount of the videos, not all of them, but I watch a decent amount of them. We have other people who watch them all as well to make sure they're good quality. And I mean, what it amounts to is I made the training site that I wish that I had, both whenever I started playing poker and today. A lot of the coaches I hired are literally the best players in the world who are the best at their area of expertise. And I hired them because I want to learn from them. And then everybody else gets to learn from them too. 
So I go through a lot of other people's content. I've always been somebody who learned from other people pretty well compared to figuring it out on my own. And so that's been very beneficial. Also, um, Justin Saliba, good, strong, world-class player, works with me. Anytime he learns something, he sends it to me. And uh, that helps me stay in, at least decent at poker. So I make a point to spend a lot of time going through other people's content and learning new skills. We also have the poker coaching study sessions that take place Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. There's a guy, Louis Philippe, who runs it. And he's really good with the GTO solver. And he goes through and finds all of these spots. And he finds, he, he basically summarizes common spots. and sends all that information to me. So I just get like spoon fed good information on a regular basis, like good consolidated information that other people are spending a ton of time learning. I mean, I guess that's just the benefit of being, being me to some extent where it just falls in my lap, but it, it just falls in my lap is what it amounts to. And if enough stuff falls in your lap, you'll at least be okay. Yeah. Hilariously, uh, Saliba's my contact with poker coaching and in the, uh, in, in the beginning, I, I thought that he was just like the, like some kind of Jonathan Little's assistant who <laughs> interfa- interfaced with me and sends emails back and forth. And then like somebody sent me a message at one point and they're like, oh yeah, he's like battling in the 50K. And I'm like, what is this dude? He's battling well, in Justin the 50K. Justin started off just being my uh, Instagram guy to some extent, but he, you know, I, he helped me with Instagram. I helped him with poker. He was playing tiny stakes poker and he worked hard, grinded hard, li- did literally everything I said to do. And you know, now he has a World Series bracelet and a bunch of caches and he plays the highest stakes. So you know, good, that's what we're trying for. The only problem is he may get too rich and quit on me, but <laughs> well, I don't, that's think, a good I don't problem. think he'll quit anytime soon. It's a good <laughs> problem to have, you know, your guys. He makes a bunch of deep runs. I mean, he just took uh, like eighth place in that tournament in Texas, the, the 5K that had all the people. And it's only a matter of time before he wins all the money. I guess he already did win a decent amount of money. But yeah. When you play high stakes, you're going to have big swings. He's playing in the, the highest stakes games against the best players in the world. Yeah, I believe it was Nick Petrangelo who was saying that like just how, you know, the variance – uh, affects things in the world of MTTs where, you know, he, he goes on like a big run where he's highly considered as like one of the best MTT players mm-hmm. in the world and then doesn't do anything for like a year. Right. And it's like, and, and then once again, goes on this like torrid run and it's like, he, he was just like, yeah, like I, I feel like I'm not doing anything different than what I was doing when I wasn't winning anything. Um, it's just that sometimes um, everything aligns and, and the results start coming um, and that's just the nature of the game. Yeah. And I mean, you got to realize when you're playing tournaments, sometimes you just lose the most important flip in every tournament. Like imagine you get it all in four times in a tournament, but one of them is going to be for all your chips. And if you lose it, well, sorry, you lose. I mean, the other day when I made the final table, I had a nice chip lead, four or five handed, whatever it was. And I just lost like seven all ins in a row. Sometimes you're going to lose seven all ins in a row and you're not going to win. Right. And like, if I had won any of them, I just would have won the tournament, had an extra, whatever, $100,000 or $70,000, whatever it is in my pocket. But instead we don't. And I probably could have lost a flip early in day one or whatever it is, right? And you're going to have a lot of swings in tournaments and you have to be well prepared for that. And if you look at the highest stakes tournaments at any point in time, there's going to be players who are down like, I don't even know, minus 50% ROI for the year, but they're like the best players in the world, right? It's just, it's variance. Sometimes you run poorly and you have to accept that. The general public doesn't seem to like that, though. They, they think that if you're winning, you must be good. And if you're losing, you must be bad. And um, sometimes it's true, but oftentimes it's not true. Yeah, it, it's not as binary as that. How, how do you feel about the Hinden mob? And this was just something that was on my mind about how the, the picture painted by Hinden mob is, let's say, not accurate since, simply because like we have the caches, but then we don't have like the downside. Um, and like, should that even be a thing that is published? Is it private information? Like, how do you feel, um, about like, oh, player X has been playing for 20 years and they have 4 million in caches, but Ooh, that's why, not good. Yeah. It's not, it's not a good thing, right? <laughs> I'd hate to be them. The math doesn't add at, up. Uh, I remember looking at the global poker index uh, a while back and I think I was like number 18 or something. And I was, um, like down <laughs> something and who I'd hate to be number 23. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're getting <laughs> or any other number on this list. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a tough thing. I think that if we were trying to make poker a legitimate sport, you probably want to make it very clear who the winners and losers are, but I don't think it's in the game's best interest to make it a clear sport because a lot of the funding for poker comes from the players who are losing and you don't want it. Well, all the money, all the money comes from players who are losing. And you don't want to do anything to discourage the players who are losing from playing your games, right? Like imagine 
every cash game player got berated every time they lost the pot. Well, the losers may get annoyed and they would quit kind of quickly, right? And posting on the internet that someone is a big loser at poker is bad for them because they're, they're not going to want to play, but also it can be bad for their life, right? Maybe they're a finance professional or something, and it's their job to make good investment decisions, yet they're bad at poker. And to be fair, maybe poker's where they blow off steam, right? You make yeah. $5 million a year and you lose $100,000 a year playing poker, probably a okay. And you don't want to do anything to make those players not want to play poker. So I, I would not be opposed to like a, a series that made it clear we are going to post wins and losses. But um, I, I don't think they need to necessarily change anything at this point in time for the end of mob because that's how it has been done. That doesn't mean it should always have been done that way. But I think it is wise to not do anything to turn off the players who are losing in the game. Yeah, that's something that I actually <laughs> didn't consider is pulling up somebody's hidden mob who is just like recreationally playing MTTs and it's like, oh, minus $3 million. <laughs> like that's probably not information that, that anybody wants publicly available. No, well, it, it's tough because maybe they, need, they, they can get in good cash games or whatever, you know? That's but <laughs> it, it, it is a tough thing because most high-level professionals want to be viewed as competent, Right. And most high-level professionals are the people who are getting paid good money. So if, you're, if you really want to be viewed as competent in your job, the last thing you want is something online saying you're really bad at something. And you know, being down a ton of money at poker would definitely do that. So I think as long as everyone agrees to that being the case, like that, that uh, presentation being the case of wins and losses, I think it's fine. But maybe end up being a pretty tough series. Yeah, and maybe it's just like uh, people who opt in for one yeah. reason or another for a specific like year long tour experiment, something like that. I mean, imagine cash games. Imagine uh, every time you won or lost, it was published on the internet, right? Or just every time it. I won. Yeah, just every time you won, <laughs> you were up a lot of money. Yeah, um, I, I would be like number one on Hinden Mob if every time I won was posted and every time I lost was never posted. Yeah, so in the Deck of the Generacy Discord, they were talking about various poker players, and somebody just like pulled up a spreadsheet they made themselves of everyone's wins and losses from the Hustler Casino show mm -hmm. recently. And they said like everybody's wins and losses for how much they're up or down in cash games. Some people are up a lot, some people are down a lot. And obviously it's still short-term variance, but imagine they run that game for five years. You're going to get a very clear picture of who is winning and losing if it's all mostly regulars, right? Yeah, and, um, they also like, play after the stream a, too like five or 10 hours, like when the stream dies. So yeah, yeah. You never know yeah. what happens after the game. Yeah, I mean, we have no idea. Were, I remember one game I, I played and I won like a ton of money. And then shortly after I just got like set over set three times and lost all my money. I was like, <laughs> sucks. But yeah. everybody thought, yeah, congrats on your big win. Like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I don't think it's necessarily good to publish the results unless you're trying to make it a legitimate sport. Are we trying to make a legitimate sport? Probably not. Maybe, but probably not. Yeah, so I tend to, I'm, tend I'm to agree so, with you. I'm not so um, turned off by it. I mean, as a cash game player, you realize you really want to play with the bad players, right? And uh, you don't want to turn them off. Exactly. Um, so shutting down today, it's been great having you on the show. Always a pleasure. Um, wh wh where do you want to direct folks who are listening right now? Poker if you are not a Poker Coaching member, head over to pokercoaching.com slash free. Maybe Brad has an affiliate code. I don't know. Say your affiliate code if you have it. <laughs> I have one, but uh, embarrassingly, I don't know what it is. Off. The come on, come on! I know. You got to put a link below in the description. Go, go use that one so Brad gets some money. Yeah, we'll, happy we'll to put, pay it, Brad put it on for, the show page. I'm happy to pay Brad for sending all of you to PokerCoaching.com. If he doesn't put it there, go to PokerCoaching.com/free. <laughs> give it a try. Uh, if you want cash game masterclass, tournament masterclass, we have a lot of content at PokerCoaching.com/premium. Follow me on YouTube, youtube.com slash poker coaching. We have a lot of content there. Brad has some content there and it's, it's a lot of fun. We did, we did a few joint videos this summer at the World Series. Maybe we'll do it again next time. And uh, those will be a lot of fun. People enjoy those. And the Deck of Degeneracy as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Deckofdegeneracy.com. Check that out. Get in the Discord. You enjoy having some of the action. All right, man. It's been great having you on. Check out all of Jonathan Little's projects. And yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm sure do this again in the near future, man. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Good luck. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. 
Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.